and she's the author of an award-winning history of the Cherokee, Black, and White peoples of early Tennessee. In addition, she is the author of the award-winning history of the first 150 years of our church, First Unitarian, which is entitled Toward the Beloved Community. And just personal testimonial for me, that is a really good book. So if you haven't gotten it yet, I recommend it. She has taught intellectual history at Reed College and has been a member of First Unitarian since 1992. And she's currently a member of our Board of Trustees. So that is all I have to say. And so let us turn it over to Cindy and let's begin. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara. Um, I appreciate that. And I want to thank Social Justice for the invitation and all of you for um, coming today, especially on Super Bowl Sunday. I can't think of another group besides Social Justice that might get this crowd. Um, and I especially want to thank Amina Amdal Mason for her tech help, without which I would have been toast in terms of this um, presentation. And I am going to say at the end of each slide, next slide, so she knows to do it. So just be prepared to hear some of that. Um, I just want to say a brief word about my choice to go back to UCLA and get this degree in um, intellectual cultural history. I did it after several decades of activism in which it became clear to me, or I actually became puzzled about how it is we in the United States, as white people especially, say that we're all created equal, but we so, equal, we so clearly don't act that way. And it seemed to me it had to be more than about our spoken, uh, understood ideology. There has to be some other factors in play here. Um, cultural factors, often implicit. So um, today, I think, I hope is a good opportunity to use this background to show how this has played out in our church um, and also hopefully to learn from it. So if I can do the next slide. I want to dedicate this to the Reverend Bill Sinkford with deep gratitude for the work he has done in advancing the story and positioning us for a better future and also to the people of color in the church and their co-conspirators and accomplices for their leadership and persistence in insisting on the true beloved community. And the next slide. Here are some loose definitions of terms I'm going to use. Uh, I understand white supremacy ideology to be the conscious ideas, laws, and practices that proclaim or assume that white people are superior because of race. And I understand white supremacy culture to be the generally implicit, unaware assumptions, laws, and practices that privilege white people, including those who have rejected white supremacy ideology. And my assumption is that culture is much harder to change than ideology because it's entirely or mostly invisible to those immersed in it and privileged by it. People immersed in a culture, and especially those privileged by it, often believe that culture is the way things are. And next slide. Um, so um, this is a sort of a, a graphic I'm drawing up based on um, what I learned when I was looking at Tennessee, <laughs> black and white and Cherokee people in Tennessee. Um, and um, just um, before I get into this slide, I just have to say a, work about, a word about some of the ironic background I have learned since I developed this slide. Um, ideas about white supremacy developed in Western Europe in the mid 1400s as Portugal and some of the other Western European countries started coming into contact with cultures much different from theirs. Initially, it was in coasts off of West Africa. At that time, as a result of the Renaissance, Western Europeans were incorporating ancient Greco-Roman thinking into their culture. Um, this is the class of Europeans who had the leisure to do this. And they recast old Roman ideas about barbarians and civilized people um, developed in the first century BCE that had justified Rome's enslavement of, and removal of millions of people in the region of the British Isles and other parts of Europe um, to, become, to be taken as slave labor for the Roman Empire. Now, ironically, Renaissance Europeans later, who were actually the long, long descendants of those people, those enslaved people, reforged these ideas about barbarians and civilized people into the ideology that looks like this. Um, this uh, ideology asso assumes that human uh, society develops in various stages. The first stage down in the bottom here is what they call the savage or barbarian stage, not to the Romans. It's the earliest stage of human society, sometimes referred to as a state of nature. They believe there's no ownership or land or property in this stage, and examples to them would have been Native Americans and Africans. The second stage of this uh, development of society is what they call the pastoral stage, where there's domestication of and property rights in animals like shepherdry. The third stage is the first stage of civilization, where farmers own, meaning they have property rights and land, 
And the fourth stage is advanced civilization that includes things like um, commerce, education, culture, Christianity, and useful arts. Okay, and then let's, um, let's move to the next slide. So this ideology, this way of thinking uh, was brought westward um, and, to, and specifically to Oregon and to Portland um, by um, mostly white settlers who were uh, sort of developed and followed the Oregon Trail originally, more or less originally. And I reproduced a map from that time that shows the Oregon Trail. You know, you can't read it very well, but this line, uh, that kind of darker line, ends in Oregon City and Portland when it was founded a couple of years later was um, right above that. And if you were able to see this map, what you would see is that um, there don't seem to be any indigenous people here. It looks like empty land to white people coming out. Um, it doesn't show the ownership or the presence of any of the original peoples on this territory. And so with this in mind, I want to say a word about the re reading that we just heard uh, that's on a plaque at the church about our land, um, our church sitting on native lands. And we can't on a small plaque, of course, really capture the damage that fully capture the damage to native peoples that white appropriation caused. So I want to dig a little deeper so that we can understand what it means when we say uh, we live on native lands. Human beings have inhabited what we call Oregon, including the Portland area, for at least 12,000 to 14,500 years. For perspective, about 3,500 years ago, the first civilizations appeared in Mesopotamia and Africa. Now these first peoples lived by harvesting. They didn't farm because they didn't own the land, they didn't have any ownership, but they harvested food that nature offered and also used resources from forest streams and other rangeland habitats. And they did so in a sustainable enough manner that it would still be there for them the next year. By at least 10,000 years ago, Salila Falls, which was rich in salmon, was a major center for indigenous peoples throughout what's now the Northwest United States, drawing thousands of people from as far away as the Rockies to trade and connect. The falls, of course, were destroyed by the Dallas Dam in 1957 over strong objections from the tribes. So these are the people on whose land our church sits today. This is who we're talking about, descendants of these people, people with a very ancient connection to these lands. These first peoples were considered, of course, savages on the Euro-American ladder of human society. They were expected to completely disappear. They did not. We have the next slide. So with that background, um, in that perspective, um, I divided the church history in relation to racism. It seemed to me it fit in four periods. And this is an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. The first period was 1865 to 1934. It was about 70 years. It was mostly um, Reverend Thomas Lamb Elliott and about 12 or 13 years of short ministries in between, and then his son, a long ministry with, with William Elliott. It was characterized by an explicit belief in the superiority of white people and the attendant culture of white supremacy. Anti-racist actions by the church were based largely on opposition to the word would be savage or uncivilized cruelty by humans. In 1934 to 66 is the second period. Our Reverend, then was Reverend Richard Siner, complete switch. He emphasized racial equality with some challenges to the culture of white supremacy as the church and its members at times worked in partnership with or under the leadership of people of color. The third period was 1970 to 2010, Reverends Alan Deal and Marilyn Sewell. And with a few important exceptions, there was general invisibility of race as a significant issue to most white congregants with the continuing culture of white supremacy. And then the fourth is our present period with Reverend Bill Sinkford, where there's more engagement with anti-racist work and work in the culture of white supremacy and overwhelming passage of the eighth principle. Okay, next slide. So here we are in period one. Um, ministries of Thomas Lamb Elliott and his son William, as I said. Our founders were mostly elite white people. And just as a background, Portland's population was about 7,000 in 1867 when Reverend Elliott came. The church had actually been founded toward the end of 1865. Um, and this is when the minister, they got a minister. And about 55,000 in 1893 when he left, and then 300,000 when his son left in 1934. So you can see that Portland was kind of booming some in the late 19th century and a lot in the early 20th century. The, um, church, these educated and mostly elite white people um, believe that educated, and I'm putting these words in quotes because they have different meanings in different cultures, but educated and civilized people were the natural leaders in this city and world. Their aim was to make Portland, and this is um, their aim, a civilized city set on the hill, which I'm going to 
show, I'm, I'm hoping to show is a racist vision and paradigm. Reverend Thomas Lamb Elliott did have connections with Reverend Tillam Brown, a local black minister that I'll talk about. And under William Elliott, there was movement away from social justice and toward what he called the inner life and no significant work against racism. And really no understanding of the culture of white supremacy by either minister or by the vast majority of white people. Let's do the next slide. Here's a look at the Ladies Sewing Society. As I think just about everybody knows, they were the group responsible for founding the church. This is about 20 years later. Um, as a picture I was able to find. As you can see, as far as I know, they were all white women. Um, and let's uh, move on. And uh, they started by building a very modest chapel to get their first minister here. And this is our Unitarian chapel in 1867. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer online. I think maybe not, but the door is facing what's now Southwest Broadway and the side of the street faces Yam Hill. And today, if you crossed Yam Hill Street and looked at that little chapel from, chapel from the side, you'd be standing on the Nordstrom's. And let's do another slide. This is our Reverend Thomas Lamb Elliott, first minister. And the next slide, um, uh, Thomas Lamb Elliott's ministry thrived. And 12 years later, the church built on the same site as the chapel had stood um, this building, much more elegant looking building. And I believe the chapel was incorporated over to the left there somewhere. The door is now facing on Hill Street. Now this church was dedicated um, when it was um, finalized in 1879 um, by Reverend Horatio Stebbins, who came up from San Francisco to deliver the dedication sermon. And in his sermon, he described the glorious progression of Oregon from its, his word was barbarian, meaning Native American stage, to its current, in his words, Anglo-American civilization. He described religion's advance from Confucianism to Judaism to Christianity, which progressed to liberal Christianity. And the Church of Our Fathers stood at the apex of all of these advances. The Lady Sewing Society met the next day and heartily approved of his speech at their meeting. So notice the point, the hierarchy towards civilization that I had described earlier. That's what he's talking about. Um, who's at the apex of that? First Unitarian, the liberal Christians were at the top. And you might notice how this second chapel, a second church soars toward the heavens, kind of in contrast to our modest 1860s, uh, 1867 chapel, which would kind of suggest that as we have become more civilized and advanced liberal Christianity, maybe we're moving toward heaven. And uh, let's see the... Um, so here is what Thomas Lamb Elliott had to say about the work in church, uh, the work of the church. He said, the work of the church in Portland extends beyond its doors to build, he said, a city set on the hill that cannot be hid, worthy to lead in commerce and the useful arts, which would be the instruments to the moral and spiritual welfare of citizens in the kingdom of a present heaven. This was in 1888. And so notice as Reverend Stebbins had done with the dedication, how this identifies the church explicitly as an agent building a Euro-American model of advanced civilization. That's the city leading in commerce and the useful arts, that's stage four of the model I showed you before, which then leads to our spiritual goal of a present heaven, which is the civilized city on earth. And in order to build um, a civilized society, um, to build that civilized city set on the hill, the church, um, in addition to having the church, it also worked outside of its doors. Whoa, I see my slides are slipping here. Um, the church worked outside of its doors to promote a civilized society. And the church um, was engaged in a lot of activities, the Lady Sewing Society, the men, we were very involved in the community. And it seemed to me that the focus on this um, of the community work really fell into three kinds of categories, all of them promoting the civilized society we talked about. Um, one category was charitable work that promoted a harmonious society by helping and elevating those in need, by relieving suffering, and also by instilling civilized values about family work, education, refinement, and so on to some of these people who didn't quite have them yet. And uh, this is an example, except I don't know what happened to my picture. <laughs> um, that was at one time a picture of the children's home in 1884, and it somehow didn't make the translation, I guess. I was going to say, Cindy, I'm working on it. Um... But I'll see if I can re recoup it. <laughs> All right. If not, imagine you see it's a big, big home, and it was for orphans. Um, today, it's um, the uh, Perry Center with Trillium Family Services. And this was to take children who didn't have a home, uh, of course, to keep them alive, but also to educate them. And there was some emphasis on, on helping them um, develop civilized values. Do we have a second slide at all? Um, well... Sadly, we don't. 
Um, the second slide was a picture from um, the page of the first uh, women's suffrage organization in Portland that was founded and in Oregon that was founded in 1872. The second kind of actions besides charitable work that the church undertook was to address systemic problems that hindered a moral and civilized society. And um, one type of uh, action, when, so there were various causes. Temperance was a cause that a lot of women supported because um, drinking was, alcoholism was a big problem. Um, the good governance movement to clean up government was another. And another, um, and many, they belong to many groups to do these things. And this, and the third was um, suffrage. And not all the women agreed about suffrage. Ah, okay, well, we're getting there. Not all, just leave that there, that's okay. And not all the women agreed about suffrage, um, but that petition that you didn't get to see was actually the, fir the first signature page on the first suffrage organization in 1872. The first signature on that page was Dr. Mary Thompson, who was a very prominent member of our church. Um, and very involved in the church's work in the community. Um, and actually a pretty cool person. She had been involved in abolitionist work in Illinois before she moved here and she risked her life to help slaves escape to Canada. And she's also a feminist and a doctor and all kinds of things. Um, this slide that you see is the third type of work the church undertook besides their charitable work and to help people in their um, actions to address the problems that were hindering a civilized society. And these are organizations and causes aimed at promoting advanced civilization. Um, schools, museum, library, and so on. They believed, uh, Thomas Eliot preached that enlightenment of the mind created spiritual growth. And two of our congregants who were quite wealthy actually founded Reed College on, on Reverend Eliot's recommendation. So the church was engaged in a lot of activities and it really was aimed to um, promote the idea of a civilized society. And can we have a next slide that has actual words on it? Ah, that's it. <laughs> um, no, wait a minute. This is yeah, he's preaching. Okay. Um, so here's what Elliot had to say on wealth creation. He used called this the law of helpfulness. Remember, the church had many wealthy congregants. He believed that the distribution of wealth in a civilized society follows what he called the law of helpfulness. The financially successful earn their wealth by their talents and labor. Um, notice how this disguises the race-based manner in which much wealth in Portland was created. The land was cheap because it was taken from native peoples and the labor was cheap in part because government and business agents lured people from China and Japan and the railroads brought black workers to Portland, all of whom worked for lower wages. And if we can see the next slide. And so I wanted to look more specifically at sort of how the church saw themselves in relation to all this in, in some ways. The church really wanted to be welcoming to everybody, and we'll, we'll see this on this slide, um, but then I'll show how those beliefs were really limited by um, particularly their attitudes toward three groups of people that were visible to them, um, indigenous peoples, Chinese, and black people. Uh, the, here's the invitation that, that welcomes everybody, and this is probably from the early 1870s. And toward the bottom, uh, you can see uh, it says a cordial invitation is extended to citizens, chain, strangers, and the poor. Uh, the seats of the church are always free. Now, that's a pretty decent piece of welcoming. Um, you, you know, no matter who you are, you're, you're welcome to come in. And the fact that the seats of the church were free was pretty significant. In those days, most Protestant churches um, raised up to 80% of their budget each year with what was called pew rentals. And this is a fee that wealthy people paid to get the best seats in the church. And also then they got to display their wealth um, because that's where they and their family and guests would sit. Um, first Unitarian board, and I read their minutes all the way back to the first meeting, struggled virtually every year to raise money for this church. This is not a new issue for us. Um, and at one point the board polled the members to see if they would like to initiate pew, pew rentals and the members voted no. So we really did want to be a welcoming church. In turn, however, this, um, this idea that we would be welcoming was really limited by the church's views about people who weren't white. And so maybe we can look at the next slide here. I want to start by talking about um, indigenous peoples. Um, Thomas Lamb Elliott, like virtually all white Americans, believed native peoples were in that earlier and inferior stage of development I talked about. Here are some words he used to describe them. Primitive, roaming, half tiger, and half lion. Now, in spite of this, he believed they could be reached. He wants, he needs, you have to move people up on that level of civilization. And so he preached at every reservation in the Pacific Northwest, and there were about 30 of them, to, uh, to his words were to elevate the life of the reservation by bringing, again, his word was civilization to native peoples 
based on his belief that without civilization, native peoples would die out. Now, Eliot was a sickly man. He took numerous leaves from the church because he worked too hard, he overworked um, and got sick and then had to take a few months off. And traveling to a lot of these reservations who which were in remote areas it had to be a hardship for him. So he sincerely believed that uh, he was doing what he thought was right. And as we know, um, these well-intentioned efforts wrecked havoc on native cultures, forcing many to lose their customs, languages, religions, and children. And this is a, a slide of the Chamawa Indian School in Salem. Uh, it was a boarding school, one of the places that he visited and taught at. And if you look to the slide on the left, um, these are native women dressed like white women, preparing food on a table like white women would do. And there's a table on the, on the side of the room that looks like it's, it's set. Um, and then the, these boys in the school are all dressed in uniform, they're younger. Um, and all these children would have been taken, or virtually all of them would have been taken from their families and they're forced to live in a boarding situation. They're forced to learn Christianity and learn white ways, so-called civilized ways. Um, so uh, yeah, let's move on to the, to the next group. But um, it, it's clear good intentions aren't enough when you're working from this ideology. Uh, this is Chinatown in 1890. In 1893, there were about 5,400 of our residents, about 9% of the population were Chinese. We had the second largest Chinese community in the United States. And between 1870 and 1904, uh, various exclusion laws and miscegenation laws eroded Chinese families by restricting entry of Chinese wives and marriage to whites. Then I would wanna just remark, um, like many wealthy Portlanders, our congregant Rosa Burrell um, had a Chinese servant. Now, Rosa Burrell was very active in the church. Her parents, uh, the Frasers, were found, two of the four, four founders of the church, and she was very generous. Her, she married a wealthy man, and on her death, the Oregonian write a, wrote an article about her remarkable will because she gave away almost all her money. Um, and she had a Chinese servant. Um, the Ch her Chinese servant um, was able to go back to his wife and children who lived in China once every 10 years. And she would not have been the only Portland a member of our church who had Chinese servants. So this is what life was like for the Chinese. There was a movement in 1886 to exclude the Chinese from Portland as an anti-Cooley League, as they were called, had done in Kakoma. Very influential by then, Eliot did speak against Chinese exclusion in the Oregonian and it was avoided. So he, he ought to be credited for that. Other than that, First Unitarian was, as best as I could tell, uninvolved with the Chinese community. And then if we can look at the next slide, um, we're looking at Black Portland around 1890. Now, a lot of you probably already know that there was a lot of discrimination against Black Portlanders um, in the state of Oregon. The state constitution in 1857 prohibited Black people from living in Oregon, it was rarely enforced, but it was discouraging. And from voting, which was overridden by the U.S. Constitution's 15th Amendment in 1870. In 1859, Oregon law prohibited Black people from owning property and making contracts. The law was rare, rarely enforced. Interracial marriage, as I mentioned with the Chinese, was um, illegal. Um, so uh, although most of these laws weren't enforced, um, it was not a very encouraging environment and not many people chose to come here. At about, and when Elliot came in 1867, about 200 of Portland's 7,000 residents were black. Um, and then about 700 of the 46,000 residents were black in 1890, shortly before he retired. So that's kind of how discouraging this was. And can I see the next slide? Because one more thing I want to say, I need to say about about um, um, discrimination against black people. Uh, and that was uh, segregated schools. In 1867, Judge Erasmus Shattuck, who was our first board moderator and was our moderator at that time, was a member of the school board who along with him voted to segregate the public school in Portland. Now the black parents appealed. Unfortunately for them, Judge Shattuck heard their case and upheld his school board's decision. The school board reversed its decision five years later because a separate school was too expensive. And Reverend e Elliot was at that meeting, but he didn't speak in favor of integration. And so let's move to the next slide because I want to talk a little bit about the, the black church in Portland. Um, there, there was a black church in Portland. It came in 1862 and it had uh, churches over in Old Town um, initially. Its first minister was Reverend Tillam Brown and I could not find a picture of him. Um, in 1880, Reverend Brown created an organization to encourage black people to move to Portland um, in spite of all the discouragement there was in the law. And Reverend Elliot helped him with the fundraising. 
So the two men developed some kind of connection between them. In 1883, First AME Zion moved from Old Town in the Northwest over to Southwest 13th and Main. And I can't, can't find a picture of the church, but Ed McLaren found me this in the city city's office. This is from 1901. And it shows this church here on this. This, of course, is now our block. We now own this block. But at the corner of the block where our church offices sit was First AME Zion Church. It was a black church. Um, and um, um, at, so anyway, uh, just an interesting piece of history to note. And at Elliott's retirement service in 1892, um, he invited Reverend Brown to come to the service and give the benediction, which Reverend Brown did. So this would have mean that he was standing up in our, what we, I think of as our pulpit area. And I would imagine he was probably the first black minister to be in the pulpit area. Now, let's, can we do the next slide? Thank you. At that retirement ceremony, here is the church remembrance that was given to Reverend Elliot. Your life of untiring labor in religious, educational, and philanthropic work, this is how they're summing up his ministry, has set in motion potent influences for the building up of a broader and grander civilization. So once again, just notice that building up in civilization language. It's still what, how the church sees itself. And uh, next slide. Uh, three, about three weeks later, um, Reverend Brown went to the Oregon legislature to lobby for amendments to repeal the state constitutional provisions that we talked about that were and against were and racist and to oppose Oregon's miscegenation law that banned interracial marriage. No one from First Unitarian was there in support and he was unsuccessful. He left the Portland church the next year and eventually became a bishop in his denomination. So let's move to the next slide. And I'm going to veer off of First Unitarian for just a moment and talk about um, First AME, First AME Church. Um, in uh, August of 1903, and this was in our interim years between the two Elliott ministries, Reverend Tillam Brown, who was now an AME bishop, returned to Portland and gave a lecture on, the title was Negro in History. About 50 people attended his lecture, which was held at the AME Church on Southwest Main and 13th, the block we now own. In his lecture, Reverend Brown pointed out that Adam was the first to use the word colored man, because according to him, the Bible said he was the color of the earth, and that when Anglo-Saxons were savages, Africans were Egypt's men of science, arts, and letters. Egypt was the world's fountainhead of culture and learning. Black men, he said, made Alexander the Great Plato, Socrates, and ancient Rome. Reverend Brown also noted the role that black men played in the Revolutionary War and all subsequent US wars. So speaking at the physical location we now occupy and remarkably ahead of his time, Reverend Brown's lecture articulated an African-centric civilization paradigm in contrast to the Anglo-Saxon civilization model used by First Unitarian and most uh, white Americans that put white people on the top. And if we can do one more slide here, um, I just need to say a couple of footnotes about this AME church. It stayed on our property um, and in 1910, property we now own, and in 1910 um, paid off its mortgage. And there was a piece in the Oregonian about how um, it paid off its mortgage and they held a big party and the, the minister wouldn't even save the ashes when he burned the document, he threw them all out. Um, they were very excited about that. And of course, we burned our mortgage, a few other, the can mortgage a few years ago, and we were pretty excited about that as well. And the first AME church re remained there until about 1916 when it relocated to North Portland where much of Portland's black population had, was then located. It remains active there today. Now, just on a sort of personal note, um, hold on just a second, well, that's all right. Uh, I wanted to say on a sort of personal note that when I was reading this about, learning all this about AME Zion, I just felt a kind of synchronicity with this church. I felt some kind of, I guess I'd say deeper non-rational sense of connection to the church that made me follow through on all this um, because they once occupied our lot and they fought for racial justice, something we largely failed to do in those days and are now working on today. Um, and Reverend Brown brought this African-centric paradigm to Portland and they even burned a mortgage. So. I realized that this pull doesn't come from my Euro-American logic brain because this is kind of coincidence in that logic brain. Um, but speaking for myself, it's, it's this learning about this church trying to touch some other part of my experience of the world. And I'd kind of be curious to know if any of you feel any pull to this. Um, okay, Amina, let's go, let's go on. Now back to my Euro-American logic brain. 
um, we're moving to um, William Elliott, his son's ministry from 1906 to 1934. And in those years, Portland was really booming, as I mentioned, 160,000 and growing. Um, the boom was fed when World War I transferred our shipbuilding industry into a major enterprise, employing people, some of them black. Black Portlanders became quite active in the early 20th century. They formed a chapter of the NAACP in 1914. They lobbied for legislative and state constitutional changes to all those discriminatory laws and practices I talked about. And they boycotted vigorously the showing of the racist film, Birth of a Nation. The Chinese community meanwhile declined as a result of the Chinese Exclusion Act, but Japanese migration increased. There's no evidence that the church supported or had any significant interest in any of these communities of color. Now, Eliot opposed racial prejudice, but he accepted the savage to civilization ladder. His ministry emphasized character was the word he used as the solution to uh, prejudice. By 1914, Eliot was disenchanted with social justice work because he believed it didn't attract the root causes of social problems, which is lack of character and something he called unfriendliness. So that was kind of uh, what his ministry was like. Um, I do want to say um, something, though, about the Ku Klux Klan in Oregon, which started in, um, yeah, okay, thank you, <laughs> um, which started around 1920 and, and occupied a lot of public life for several years. In the 20s, a conservative backlash led to the emergence of an Oregon Klan with significant political clout that preached that American democracy and civilization reflected the values of Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans. It targeted a mixture of racial, religious, and ethnic Americans, Japanese and Chinese Americans, Catholic Jews, and other immigrants, and sometimes black people as an American. They sought and got pro Protestant church support, and you see them here in a Protestant church in Portland. This was a pretty common picture in the early 20s. The use of the Klan name, the fact they chose that name rather than some other name, emphasized its uh, white supremacy philosophy, even when the targets were not people of color. And Thomas Lamb Elliott, who was interim minister emeritus, did have an usher remove two Klansmen in 1922 who came to our church service in Klan's masks. They were going to leaflet for a Klan's event. Uh, his son had walked by and stopped and spoke to them and said he didn't approve of masks, but he didn't remove them. And when his father showed up for church, he had to usher throw them out. Um, let's look at the next, next slide if we can. In 1923, a Klan-sponsored bill to prohibit ownership or leasing of land by aliens, was the word the bill uses, aimed primarily at Japanese and Chinese nationals, passed the legislature easily. I couldn't find any evidence that First Unitarian opposed this bill. One of our prominent um, members, W.F. Woodward, was almost certainly a member of the Klan. Uh, he was the board member from 19, as you can see the years there, 19, but for about uh, 30, more than 30 years, 30 years on him. 25 years, 24 years, and he was moderator for about 14 years. The church historian, our church historian in, 19, in the 1960s, said that a prominent church member was a member of the KKK at this time, and I feel sure this is who it was. Woodward actively pursued the Klan's anti-Catholic agenda as head of the Portland Public Schools in 1923, and in 1924, with Klan support, he was elected to the state legislature, where he continued to champion the Klan's agenda. In spite of uh, Woodward's open support for the Klan, William Elliott did strongly and publicly oppose the Klan's anti-Catholic agenda. Okay, now let's move on. So now I'm gonna move into period two. Um, and this is the uh, period of the ministry of Reverend Richard Steiner, 1934 to 66. It was characterized, this was a complete switch with emphasis on racial equality and integration with some inroads into the culture of white supremacy. Um, Reverend Steiner was a Christian of Jewish heritage on both sides of his family. He had rejected the, he, he rejected the ideology of white supremacy. He preached strongly against racism, and um, he encouraged the church, church to undertake anti-racist work. Um, church membership initially dropped. It was by about half because he was preaching a very different method, method or system of thinking. And then it increased dramatically during and after World War II with the church having its highest membership ever under Reverend Steiner. He drew in a different kind of congregant. Many church programs and individual church members became involved in anti-racist work, especially after World War II, knowledge of the Holocaust and growth of the Black Civil Rights Movement. And if we can have the next slide. Um, Reverend Steiner preached strong messages early, starting in 1934, certainly shortly after his arrival, and often against racism. 
He told his congregants if they were guilty of feelings of racial superiority, then they were less Christian and slowed the process of achieving the kingdom of heaven on earth. Steiner linked the concept of racial superiority in 1942 to the Holocaust in Europe. Fascists in Europe successfully promoted race superiority in his words, since so many Englishmen and Americans have believed this implicitly for a long time. And if we can see the next slide, um, what he said during World War II is if there is to be moral progress in the world, if there is to be peace in the world, we shall have to learn that God made of one blood all the nations of men eh, to dwell upon the face of the earth. And then can we see the next slide? So these are just some examples of his diligent work against black discrimination. He was a member of the Selective Service Appeals Board during World War II, and he successfully used his position to pressure unions in the defense industry to admit black workers as members. Those were much better paid jobs. He leased our church basement. I don't know how many people knew this. Our church basement was leased to the USO for sleeping quarters for black soldiers in the war. In 1945, First Unitarian was one of only five, black or five Protestant churches other than the black churches that admitted black people as members. So we had some black members by then. In 1951, Steiner worked behind the scenes with the Urban League and Congressman Wayne Morris to abolish racial segregation in Fort Lewis, Washington. He was actually quite instrumental in that. Um, he served on the City Club and was part of a committee that studied and opposed segregation in Portland Public Schools. And then let's see the next slide and we'll see where he joined with about um, 400 protesters in a march sponsored by the NAACP to condemn the violence in Selma in 1965. The uh, black organizers are on the left and sort of a little behind them here is um, in the center is Reverend Steiner and another clergyman. I don't know who that is. Okay, can we make next slide, yeah. Now he was slower uh, to recognize discrimination against Japanese Americans, very uncharacteristic of him. He and the church were silent in Japanese American removal and internment in 1942. By the next year, he recognized his error and preached that animosity toward Japanese Americans was, as he said, a danger to the fabric of our moral purpose. And in 45, he joined the West Coast Universalists in approval of the end of Japanese American exclusion from the Pacific Coast. Okay, and how about some next slide? Here's some of the other church work against racism. The Women's Alliance, which had previously been pretty apolitical, became very engaged in racial justice work from 1940 to 1970. They sponsored numerous programs and activities related to racism. In 1944, their work included forming an interracial friendship club for a couple, they, these are their words, colored and white women of all denominations. After 45, they had a <clears throat> subcommittee on race relations and in 56 established an interfaith committee here, um, headed by Mary Fernandez. And after that time, they were also involved with migrant workers. And um, next slide, some other church groups. Um, where the board, um, the board initially had been hesitant to get involved with work because they felt like they needed a consensus, but by 1959, the Congress were pushing them. And so the board became more active in civil rights works. And here are a few examples from that period. They sent $100 to the New Orleans church in a difficult financial position because it supported integrated schools. They collected money for the family of James Reeb, who had been killed in Selma. And the board released an assistant minister to serve a Mississippi church for three weeks after its minister was shot in the back for his desegregation efforts. And the board also stopped the John Birch Society from distributing literature on the church premises, a big contrast to what happened with um, William Elliott. Okay, next slide. Um, some other anti-racist actions, these are just some. The program for youth and children addressed racism. Individual congregants carried anti-racist values into the community. And I wanted to mention too, um, one was Alan Hart, who's an attorney. He handled the case that overturned the Klan supported anti-Japanese alien land law. And he also used his position on the State Board of Higher Education to establish uh, non-discrimination policies in fraternities and sororities. And Don Marmaduke, a congregant attorney, also went to Mississippi in 1965 to desegregate the county courthouse in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where three civil rights workers had just been murdered. I've talked to people who were in Philadelphia that summer, and that was an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Um, and next slide, um, in terms of the culture of white supremacy, I feel like the ch church did challenge the culture in some ways. Um, rather than assuming the lead, the church worked with groups or in support of groups of color. Reverend Steiner had done that with the Urban League to desegregate Fort Lewis and also marched with the NAACP. Um, okay, and now let's move on. This is period three. Um, 
1970. I hope folks are still with me here, but we're, we're moving on here. Um, this is the periods, uh, the ministries of Reverend Alan Dio and Marilyn Sewell. And this was characterized by a growth of extensive Latinx organizing in Oregon beginning about 1970, actually maybe a year or two sooner than that. Um, Native American, African American, Asian American, and other kinds of activism. It's a general invisibility of race is a significant issue to most of our white congregants with a continuing culture of white supremacy. And for both ministers, much energy and funds were devoted to acquiring and developing the block. The congregants, especially in the earlier parts of all this, were generally more interested in personal growth and or other social justice causes. And this is where the church shifted to using ministers' first names, so I will too. Very good, thank you, Amina. <laughs> so this is Reverend Alan Deal. And in general, Alan's ministry moved away from racial justice to an emphasis on block development, personal growth, feminist and LGB rights and death with dignity. They were, people were active, just not in causes involving race. The major exception was work with Native Americans in the early 1970s. The church gave free space to Native American Youth Association, NAYA, which still exists today, but under a much longer name and it has a much broader mission. And um, let's look at the next slide because um, the church also stood bail for two, two jailed American Indian movement activists, Loud Hawk and Russ James Redner, who you see here in these pictures, um, along with Alan Deal, who's on the far left. And then gave, and he, Reverend Deal also gave the pulpit one Sunday, and if we can see the next slide, we'll see him, to uh, American Indian, Native American Indian activist Dennis Banks, who was the co-founder of the American Indian Movement. And he, along with his wife, had been arrested with Loud Hawk and Redner. And there you see him, he's in the middle, That's, and Alan Deal is to his right, and a congregant is to his left. I'm assuming that might be the Sunday that he was preaching. Um, no, that's okay, let's do the next slide. And there was some other church work against racism. Um, it was limited. Um, Alan at times preached on other racial justice issues and he served for a few years on the Police Internal Investigations Audit Committee, but it was, that was pretty modest work. And then let's move on to Marilyn Sewell. You see her wrapping the ribbon around the block here when she first came. Um, and um, Marilyn, uh, we can go ahead and look at the next slide, I think. Uh, she built a social, comprehensive social justice program and she hired Kate Lord to staff it. That was one of her big contributions. In terms of work related to racism, she did preach that social justice is integral to everyone's spirituality and she preached sermons on racial justice issues. But the social justice program did not have a group focused on addressing systemic racism. It did bring in speakers on topics related to racism and worked in coalitions with anti-racist groups. There were some congregants who showed interest. Uh, there's a congregant-led uh, racial justice group that offered education about racism and support for people of color from about the mid-90s to the 2000s. And I want to give a shout out to Theo Harper for his dedication to the group and for this information. And the board was interested in 2007 to 2009 in addressing racism as well. And so then let's move on to our current minister. I think we all know Reverend Singford. Um, and um, his ministry has been characterized obviously by greater uh, ministerial and congregational engagement in anti-racist work and some work on the culture of white supremacy. The um, 2009 and 10 search committee survey identified public witness and diversity as areas of importance. Now, Bill works to make the church more welcoming to people of all races. He offered, early offered a beloved congregations curriculum grounded in spiritually based principles to promote learning about race by all congregants. His preaching is aware of the interest of issues of race. He hired Jero Farrar to head the music program, which offers a wider range of music from diverse cultures. We, of course, social justice, look who I'm talking to, does have programs working on racism. And Bill spoke as First Unitarians ministered a number of community events organized by BIPOC leaders. And if we look at the next slide, um, we will see him at the Trayvon Martin rally in 2012 speaking. And there's, um, since then, there's been some uh, source other work. He spearheaded an integrated approach to racism throughout church life. The church through its minister, social justice programs, adult and children's religious education, music program and other programs uh, and individual congregants regularly learn about, speak and act against institutional racism. The church has an affinity group now for people of color. Um, Many church groups have been doing or are looking at work on the culture of white supremacy. And there's a, been a strong presence at the BLM protests. Um, we also joined a successful lawsuit with Western states against federal actions aimed at suppressing dissent. 
So these have clearly been the most extensive efforts against institutional racism since Reverend Steiner's ministry. And if we look at the next slide, um, I think uh, the adoption of the eighth principle, which you're all familiar with, Bill created a diverse leadership team to educate the congregation and bring consideration of the eighth principle to the congregation. Because it amended the bylaws, it had to be adopted by both the board and the members. The board voted 100% and the voting members 93% in favor. Um, and so um, the church continues to try to follow through on this by learning how to live this out, working with centering on the voices of people of color and those from the margins. And I want to conclude with um, um, a look at Bill Singford, uh, what he has to say about our vision of racial justice. He said, at least the choice is clear. Our vision and our dream of an abundant, pluralistic, multicultural, multi-religious future in which we can all see ourselves or being asked to settle for scarcity and the inequality and the violence of the world the resistance fights to maintain. We do not need to wait. The future is now and there is a fierce urgency that comes with it. We can move forward together, grounded in our vision, grounded in our dream, but also held up, our spirits lifted off the ground by the example of our ancestors who made a way out of no way. Called forward by our ancestors like Dr. King and so many more, those ancestors whose lives pointed the way toward hope. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I think maybe I'm going through the few questions that I raise. So my questions are really geared toward my approach as a cultural historian, the first two are. Um, I like to look at the subtle ways that culture replicates itself both in myself and in, a, in the larger church. And so these first two questions are an effort to do that with our church history. My first question is, uh, our first principle starts with the individual and moves toward community with our seventh and eighth principles. Now, I think this unconsciously mirrors the Western European philosophical approach that starts with a state of nature consisting of individuals who then make a social compact to move into community. Many cultures, including many indigenous East Asian cultures have different origin stories and prioritize community as central. Should we reconsider our emphasis on individualism and or the order of our principles? And the second question is, uh, do our theology and our unspoken values still contain residues of the racism of Anglo-American beliefs? For one example, you use today, like 19th century Unitarians, often privilege Euro-American notions of, I just put these in quotes because these words mean different things in different cultures, education, intelligence, and reason. Reason is in our mission statement. Now, all cultures educate and have a cultural logic that makes sense of the world, some in ways that are very different from Euro-American systems of reasoning. How can we make space for and learn from other ways of experiencing, understanding, and passing on knowledge about the world? And then my third question is one that social justice suggested and I think is excellent. Should First Unitarian be accountable for a history of racism? What might accountability reparations look like? And then finally, I just want to invite people, if, if there are other questions, you may have other questions and thoughts, don't feel combined, don't feel too controlled by what I identified. Um, it'd be interesting to hear what other questions or, or you have or points that struck you. And then my last slide is just, a, uh, this is the name of the book if you decide to order it. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Nell Painter in A History of White People, which is where I got some of that ironic look at how originally great but people in what's now Great Britain were enslaved and later they embodied that in uh, that ideology and turned it around to in essence enslave other people so um, she's a great historian although and the book is in the library it's also a very dense read so just to let you know okay I think I'm done